Voter suppression. Does it really exist? A lot of people are saying that voters' rights are under attack nationwide as states pass voter suppression laws. Now, these laws can lead to significant burdens for eligible voters trying to exercise their right, their most fundamental constitutional right to vote. So what is voter suppression exactly? What does that mean? I want you to hold on to that for a moment. I'll give you a couple of examples. Some of us may remember, some may not, might have read about it in your history books, may have just heard conversation about it, maybe just saw it somewhere or heard it in the news. But poll taxes, poll taxes that were established back in the 1800s. In Virginia, right here in Virginia, poll taxes were upheld until the abolishment in 1964. In 1962, there were only five states that still had poll taxes. Virginia was one of them. That is voter suppression. Jim Crow laws. We've all heard of the Jim Crow laws. We've all seen the history behind that. That is definitely, or was definitely voter oppression. Jim Crow laws were enforced well into 1965, uh, primarily in the South, of course. Now we talked about RBG, Justice Ginsburg previously, and many may not know, but Justice Ginsburg founded the ACLU Women's Rights Project back in 1972. This was actually one of her many legacies that um, she left behind. And by 1974, the Women's Rights Project and the ACLU affiliates had participated in over 300 sex discrimination cases. And between 1969 and 1980, 66% of the gender discrimination cases that were upheld, they participated in. So I'm telling you all of this because some of those landmark cases included the 2016 case where a federal appeals court struck down North Carolina's harshest voter suppression law, which was requiring voter IDs um, right before voting. And it also eliminated same day voter registration. So you could go and register and vote all at the same time. And this particular law, uh, well, this bill that they were trying to put forth that was struck down was going to eliminate all that. And all of the different types of IDs that you would normally use or I would normally use or my children might use, they were saying, no, 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 those are not good enough. But the court ruled that the law was enacted with discriminatory intent. And with, and I quote, almost surgical precision. See, voter suppression has a long history in the United States. And every now and again, you'll see it rear its head. So when we say that with almost surgical precision, what does that mean? With almost surgical precision, it targeted African-Americans. Now, why would someone make a statement like that? I'll give you a hint. So prior to drafting this law, North Carolina legislators requested data on voting patterns by race. Why, why would you do that? Why does it matter? If, if you want to get a voting pattern, just get the voting pattern. Why does it matter what race it is? And then immediately after getting this um, data report, bam, here's that law. But thankfully, they struck it down. And um, that's not an issue right now, right now. So I know you have your eyes wide open, but don't be shocked because North Carolina has a history of voter suppression. You know, voter suppression, as I said, is any effort either legal or illegal by ways of law, administrative rules, or tactics that stop eligible voters from registering to vote or voting. And it tends to target people of color disproportionately in comparison to whites. Now, back to the history of voter suppression. So sticking with North Carolina, um, and we're talking about the whole ID thing, 
the bill that was the HB 589, that was the law that I was just previously speaking about with the IDs. They also deemed that as the monster voter suppress law because it didn't allow certain forms of ID, like I stated before. And let's say school ID. A lot of people have school IDs. Not everybody has a driver's license. So why can't I use my school ID? What's wrong with that? But they said no. So thankfully that was struck down, but that is a form of voter suppression. Now, North Carolina is not alone. There's a lot of voter suppression that's out there. And it's, it's been going on since forever. You know, in 2002, the New Hampshire Senate election phone jamming scandal is what they called it. Um, that's back where, um, up in New Hampshire, there was one party that had officials attempting to reduce the number of the other party's voters by paying professional telemarketers in a whole nother state to make repeated hangup calls to their telephone numbers. And uh, the telephone numbers that they were doing the hangup calls to was the ride to the poll line on election day. So if you needed a ride to go to the poll so you can vote and you called this party line so you can get that ride, but because the people in the other state were calling and hanging up, it was tying up the lines. So by tying up the lines, voters trying to get a ride would have more difficulty reaching the party to ask for transportation to and from their polling places. That's voter suppression. In 2004, we had a, a Michigan state legislator who flat out said, if we do not suppress the Detroit vote, we're gonna have a tough time in this election. Well, you don't need very much more evidence than that when somebody said, we don't suppress. Suppress is the key word here. If we do not suppress this vote, we're gonna have a tough time in the election. I don't know how many of you have heard of John Kerry, but in 2006, four of his employees uh, were convicted of slashing tires of 25 vans rented by the other party, which was to be used for driving voters and monitors to the polls. They got jail terms from four to six months. I hope it was worth it. And uh, I, I recall them saying that at that hearing that the uh, judge that presided over the case said, you know, voter suppression has no place in our country. Your crime took away the right to vote for some citizens. Where's the justice in that? Right here in Virginia in 2006, the Senate election, um, voters are receiving calls incorrectly, saying voting's gonna lead to arrest. Where they do that at? Since when is voting, I'm going I'm to get arrested for voting? It's my right. Now, my, back in the day, you might got arrested trying to vote, but we're beyond that. They had widespread calls falsely telling voters that their voting location had been changed. One party even paid for flyers saying, skip this election. <laughs> And that was in 2006, right here in Virginia. I mean, there, there's so many different elections that we can talk about where there was voter uh, suppression or alleged illegal acts. Um, you know, in 2016, voter suppression impacted four states, specifically, again, North Carolina with the whole voter ID thing, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin and Texas. Right now in Texas, the governor is uh, mandating that some of the drop-off boxes be removed. And that's right. The governor is limiting their drop box locations. In Harris County, and that's their largest county, they're going from 11 drop-off boxes to one. Now, if you had 11 before, I don't need to do the math there. That's dropping down a thousand percent. If I needed 11 and now you're saying I can only have one, how is that supposed to work? In the largest county in Texas. In South Carolina, the party is asking the Supreme Court to reinstate witness signatures for mail-in ballots. Why do I need somebody to witness me signing my ballot? It's mine. If I got it, it's me. 
But like I said, you know, these things are still happening. Voter suppression is very much real. The Voting Rights Act of 1965, those who know me know I'm data driven. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed 77 to 19. That means that 19 people felt like all of us shouldn't have the right to vote under all circumstances. And that was at the Senate level. When it got to the House level, 333 said yes and 85 said no. So again, 85 people who said no. But even still, on August 6, 1965, the, voting's right, the Voting Right Act was passed. So, you know, right now, there's a lot going on. The bill, um, you know, it originally banned such things as liter literacy tests, provided the federal oversight for voter registration in a lot of areas, upheld poll taxes, things like that. Um, but there's pieces of it right now that have expired. And even with all that's going on, the, the, the House of Representatives passed the bill in 2019. We're in 2020. They passed the bill in 2019. And that was to restore those key sections. But it has yet to be brought to the floor for the Senate. So in 2020, which is where we are now, they renamed the bill, the John Lewis Act, to honor the late civil rights champion. We all know who John Lewis was, who recently passed away. But again, it has yet to be brought to the floor, which is why, one of the many reasons why it is important for you to vote. We have elected officials right now with acts that are so important, with, with bills sitting on the floor that are so important yet they won't act and we voted these officers if you will so at some point there has to be change there has to be change treat voting like any other thing that you cannot have you you know you, you told your daughter your child your baby you can't have that piece of candy they do everything they can to find that candy you told the teenagers they couldn't drive a the car they, Try to find a way to drive a car. You're in college, and maybe you felt like you couldn't overcome that hard test, but you did everything you could to pass it. You were interviewing for that job, and just was so far out of reach, but you knew you could do it. Anything worth having is worth fighting for. Your ancestors have already fight for your right to vote, yet there are some cases where you still have to do it now. So use your voice, exercise your right to vote. Let your vote be your conversation for change. Don't be silent. Now's not the time for silence. Speak out with your vote.